Good afternoon and welcome to the second session of our webinar series, What Will Schools Be Like Next Year? Visioning for the Future of Education with CEI Executive Director, Dr. Christine Mason, Executive Director of the Michigan Elementary and Middle School Principals Association, Paul Liebenau, and Principal of Upper Providence Elementary School, Dr. Melissa Patchke. My name is Dana Asby and I will be your webinar manager and host. Today's meeting will last approximately one hour and there will be a brief opportunity to stick around for a conversation afterwards. We ask that everyone keep their microphones muted during the presentation. At certain times during question and answer sessions, you can use the raise your hand feature to request an open mic. But when speaking, please eliminate any background noise. Thanks to a partnership with C4 Innovations, we're offering one hour of continuing education credit for participation in this webinar. We can also offer you a certificate of participation. For record keeping purposes, you must identify yourself while on the meeting platform using first and last name or email address you use to register for the event. You can either ensure your name appears as a part of your video panel or enter it in the chat box. Registration confirms your consent to receive an evaluation follow-up link via email and your consent to recording. If you experience any technical issues, please send a private chat to Ingrid Paget, our technical support manager for today's webinar. You're also able to gain access to our Basecamp resource platform. We have topics ranged around youth mental health and trauma, a variety of resources, including webinars, curricula, program, and uh, other and opportunities to get answers to questions. If you're interested in joining our Basecamp platform, you'll be invited after this webinar. And today I would like to introduce our three presenters. Dr. Christine Mason is an educational psychologist and CEI's founder and executive director. Chris is a nationally recognized expert in the area of educational reform, mindfulness, teacher, education, teacher mentoring, and special education. She has made more than 500 national, international, regional, and local presentations on topics ranging from inclusion and idea to student self-determination and integrating the arts. Paul Liebenau worked with a team of leaders as executive director of the MEMSA. To realize the MEMSA vision, he redesigned its programs and offerings to better meet the needs of African-American and Latinx principal leaders in urban areas such as Detroit. Missy Patchke has served public education for over 30 years. She has taught in a variety of special and regular education programs, worked at the middle and elementary levels, and served students from both urban and suburban areas. Missy has hosted national webinars, trained national mentors, and published articles featuring best practices for schools. Thank you again for joining our webinar. And Dr. Mason, I turn it over to you. Welcome. You know, we never would have dreamt that we'd, we would be visioning with you during a time like this. When Missy, Paul, and I wrote our book, we were thrilled to be in this position of thinking of what we could do to advance education. We had concerns then about equity, about social emotional learning, about alleviating trauma, and about helping to make sure that all students could learn as efficiently and effectively as possible. We also had concerns about schools, about school leadership, about collaboration. You know, and all those things remain concerns. However, in many ways, if you look at what's been happening over the past three months, and then most recently the last week, our concerns just multiply and multiply. So we're, what we will do today is our attempt to guide you through this process. So we're taking what we've written about in our book on Visioning Onward and modifying it slightly, adapting it to our current situation. And the way we're adapting it is to consider what we call macro and micro elements. The macro elements are those things related to the world and the global, global look at education and society. The micro elements are those things that relate to strategies and instructional techniques. The smaller elements that make up effective classrooms and effective instruction. So our goals are to problem solve about the future, to share with you something about our iterative process, provide ideas for you to share with others back home, 
and set the stage for visioning. Next slide. Here is our eight step process. As you go through this webinar, and actually you could even go back to the one we have archived, the first one, and the third one in the series coming up on June 15th, we will take you through those eight steps. However, what we're doing today is focusing largely on steps three and four, and largely on the research exemplars. So helping you look at exemplars, and from that perspective, hopefully guiding you into the future. So welcome, uh, friends that are joining us this afternoon. It's time that we have a courageous conversation about equity and equality, but specifically about equity. Martin Luther King quoted in the end, we'll remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. The situation that we faced in cities across the country after the death in Minneapolis is problematic. And we all own it together. We have to find a solution. I had conversations this morning with board members, my African American friends, who are heartbroken like we are. And we must join together to find answers to solve this long ongoing problem. Are we getting better? Possibly yes. But racism is still inherent bias, covert, and sometimes overt. And today we need to be serious about finding a solution. We need to armor up together to find a solution. Chris? Sure. I just want to point out that I think it was just last week, uh, Maria Restrepo Toro, who manages the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center where we do our work, did a presentation on courageous conversations and equity. And there's actually a four-step process that people have written about and practiced. We are going to have more webinars in the future, more information coming out about that four-step process. But you can visit our archives and see her presentation. We believe that it's time for communities to have serious dialogue. And that it needs to be done in such a way that in fact we honor and uplift everyone. And particularly we turn, we turn towards justice and equity as we do it. Next slide. As we go through our webinar today, if you have any comments, feel free to, to write them in the chat box. As Dana said, we will give you an opportunity at the end of the session to join us if you want to in breakout rooms. If you have particular ideas for conversations, just make a note and we'll try to pay attention to those as we plan for those sessions with you. So looking at the macro elements, you know, for our first webinar, we turned to uh, more of a conservative think tank. And we saw some of what they're saying in terms of a blueprint for the future. Today, we're going to some recommendations partly from the World Future Society, but these are from more progressive um, viewpoints. So this starts with Muhammad Yunus, who was a Nobel um, Prize winner. And he is the, the person in India who actually started micro lending and micro banks, if you remember that. And he says, really, right now, there are two visions. One, to return to the status quo, and the other, to rebuild a world. And he says, the world we need to rebuild will be one with maximum social and environmental benefits to society. However, businesses will play a key role in achieving social purpose. The second view of a post-COVID-19 society comes from John Davis, who's an environmental architect uh, in California. And he has written about reintegrating wildlife into urban areas. He begins his blog post um, talking about a conference that was recently held in the Netherlands with something like 70 scientists. 
And what Davis is saying, not only do we need to see growth in health, education, and clean energy sectors, but there's some areas where we need to see what he calls a degrowth. And that would be, you know, putting a halt to consumerism, to uh, depleting our environmental reservoirs, to considering what we should do in terms of equity and such things as a universal basic income, what we can do with food production, reducing travel and debt forgiveness. Next slide. So as we reflect on our conversation, the last webinar, those of you who were able to join us, we talked a lot about how our culture and how our society has shifted during COVID-19. And some of the pieces that are just absolutely relevant to everything that's moving forward is our ability to be collaborative, to be empathetic of others, and to be resilient. I would just add to this, this slide is based on some discussion by Rudy Kimmy, who is a professor in South Africa. And so what we're giving you today is an international perspective, some of it from developing countries, right? And it's interesting, if you look at collaboration, empathy, problem solving, these are very similar to what we call our heart-centered learning approach and our approach to alleviating trauma. Building resiliency is critical and all of us are going to really need to consider what we can do to help uplift ourselves and others to be more resilient. Chris, we have, we have talked about these, these five, collaboration, empathy, problem solving, critical thinking and resilience uh, for the past 20 years. I've been at this now for 39 years, uh, working in K-12, principal, teacher, superintendent. But we're moving into a new era where these are more important than ever in our country's history, both in support of third world growth and uh, protecting our own democracy. And so building resilience is really, really important, but empathy and collaboration are more, more important now than ever before, so that we bring up the standard of living for, for everyone to a basic level uh, and increase our care, our empathy, but our care for, that is physical care for others that we've left behind. We can go back a century and see and learn something from our forefathers in that space. If I will just can just add right here to Rudy uh, Kimmy says also, this will be a messy process. You know, we'd like to have things organized, right? <laughs> we'd like to have our, our strategic plan developed and implement things in a sequential manner. He said, you know what, it's going to take some maneuvering, some navigation as we go through this process. It will be disruptive. It is disruptive already. However, it is essential. As we consider looking at the macro elements, one of the things <laughs> we realized is that today, the relationship between parents and children is changing. The relationship between educators and parents is changing. So there's an organization called Learning Heroes. They recently did a survey of over 3,600 parents and they're finding that parents feel more connected. Now that's a plus for many, many families, not all families, some are stressed out and some don't know what to do, but some families are really prospering with their connections with children. We also know that teachers are telling us that sometimes they're feeling more connected to families, those families they can reach. You know, we have some children we're not connecting with right now, which is just, it's horrible. But when we can reach families, sometimes there's a stronger connection right now. As we consider the future and what should happen, we realize that some of our logic models for education just are inadequate. And so we turn to family systems therapy. And there's some research that was done even way back in the 1980s by Charles Figley. And then Pauline Boss has been working in this area for a long time. And she even updated this, I think, as recently as uh, 2017. One of the premises is 
some families are going into this time of crisis in a state of dysfunction already. They're lacking resources. Maybe they don't have good ways of handling their problems. They may be quick to, there may be someone in the family who's quick to anger. There could be abuse. And they may not be able to anticipate what they need to do to best protect themselves and their families. Chris, I really think that's an excellent point. As a school principal, there are many children and families that we're worried about. And as you noted on the previous so slide, there are some that are ab absolutely stepping up and just knocking this out of the park as far as team players. One of the pieces that um, I, I know as a school leader, I am keeping strong in my vision as we approach fall, is that there will be a higher need than ever for the social emotional tools and approaches and supports in reunification with children and with families uh, in whatever that looks like for the fall. We have children that have gone through a financial crisis. We have racial concerns now out very open. We have um, families that have dealt with death and uh, other COVID issues. And we know that some of our children have been re-traumatized. So I think this is an excellent point. So it's also important that we really focus on moving beyond coping to building resilience. Because COVID-19 isn't the last and final challenge that we're gonna be facing over the course of the next decade or two. More things will come. We need to be better equipped to handle uh, the challenges that we're going to face. I've learned a lot about coping with three littles. Um, we are, my wife and I are at age 63, along with our full-time work, sometimes 10, 12 hours a day now, are trying to provide two and a half to three hours of instruction for a three, six, and eight-year-old. So we have a great deal of respect for principals and teachers, social workers, and other school leaders. And we're trying to build, both in ourselves and in our grandchildren, resilience to better prepare us for the next thing. So take a deep breath, wow. <laughs> Think of all we're handling and it just seems like you turn on the news, you know, you um, tap into your digital news and there's something else. We know from the research on neuroscience that when our brains are stressed, we're less likely to make good decisions. We're more likely to go to a place where in fact our brains are hijacked into the area of trauma. And trauma can lead us to being concerned, overly alert. And as we're overly alert to danger, we may miss out on some of the deeper thinking we need to engage in. We may let our emotions um, take us away from being centered in making good decisions. So as you think about visioning and doing visioning, back home in whatever form that takes, whether it's informal conversations or a more formal process. We believe it's really import, important that you have a mindful awareness. So mindfulness includes taking some deep breaths, moving your bodies through yoga, stretching, exercising, being aware of those around you, being aware of your emotions, being aware of your environment, being aware in the moment without judgment, as John Kabat-Zinn would say, or even perhaps meditating. And you know, there's some research that says that as you meditate, the brain changes. You can calm yourself down. And as you do this, you will be more likely to make more effective decisions. This whole process is part of our approach to heart-centered learning. And as we said in the last webinar, we've written a couple books in this area. You can research um, my name online, you'll find them. But we do have some guidance for you in terms of how to handle trauma through a mindfulness approach. Missy, you wanna take this one? Sure. So one of the most important pieces that we advocate for in the process of visioning is being inclusive of those of your team and the opinions, uh, both those that you feel are in 
congruent with with your system, but also it's important to hear from those in the opposition of the direction that you think you're going. And in saying that, when you include stakeholders from all perspectives, you're going to be able to drive a vision with, um, with a power and synergy that people own, that human beings want to see happen. And you know, a lot of the work that John Haiti has done around the impact of beliefs and the impact of collective efficacy all relates to this element. So as you, one of the things we asked you to do if you joined us the last time was to really think about who, it, who do you need on there? And I remember specifically Paul challenging you to make sure that you're bringing in voices that aren't always those that you feel you need to hear from because that collective song that comes across is exactly what will drive your vision to where it needs to go. So as we think about visioning, you know, it could be a process that's very much like the one we laid out in the book, where in fact you meet with some key people that you trust and you share your ideas and you learn from them and then you prepare and you get ready to go out and broaden the circle, the number of people who are engaged. At this point in time, it may be that you're having discussions with friends, relatives, a variety of people your teachers, other leaders, and you're just kind of compiling ideas, you're sharing ideas, and you're sharing the process. So point number one here is that visioning is a shared process. It isn't something that the leader hands to you. Oh, I've got my vision. No, no, we really believe the strongest visions come when there's commitment from others. That provides the synergy that Missy was talking about. We also believe that you need to think about these elements. <clears throat> Certainly you want an ideal vision. <clears throat> we also know that particularly at this time right now, it's hard to get too optimistic, to get way out there. You, you, you kind of pull yourself back in a little bit because you're not sure if that, that vision that's really, really ideals, idealistic will really even work. So you're gonna temper the idealistic with the practical. However, as you do this, be inclusive. Think of equity. Think about the students and families that most need support. Know that you'll need some flexibility because things are shifting moment to moment, day to day. And this is like a, a large scale experiment in many ways. Even as we look to other countries who've already opened their schools back up, we gain some information. Still, we never know what's around the corner. So you need to keep that sense of adaptability and flexibility. Even as you do this, venture out and explore some of the things we've been talking about. Be bold, but do it with compassion and empathy. I think all these are really important for your process and for our future. So where are we right now? We're in an interesting time as we all have already identified. We have an educational system that's been fractured. We know that some of our school systems are doing very, very great, good to great work in this remote or distance learning situation, but some have truly not even been able to reach out to their children or families. Um, we also absolutely know that the inequities that were already a problem have escalated on many platforms. Those who have um, solid family homes with a caring adult involved could be flourishing at this time. Um, those who we can't find or children that are, are not English speaking uh, first language at home, there's a variety of, of possibilities, but they are not necessarily accessing in any equitable level education that they're their co their co peers could be. So as I talked about before, also the need for our social emotional supports coming into this upcoming school year and in our communities right now is so large. I love in the chat that one of our uh, participants mentioned: we need to reach out. We need to touch base with human beings and make sure that we're checking in on each other, whether it's 
friends, colleagues, or neighbors that are impacted by the racial inequities and the, the emotions going on right now, or children that we see that may not have access to uh, food or um, education or other main like baseline needs. So we're in quite a interesting spot and we're hoping by the end of our time together, you'll have some ideas of how we're gonna suggest that we can move through. So the majority of our time for the next 35 minutes <laughs> or half the time will be spent on examples of, of research exemplars in the, the micro element area. And then the, the remaining time will be spent on what do you do? How do you really develop a vision statement? And we'll give you some examples from others. So as we move through, um, if you have anything to write in front of you, pay attention to what do you hear from us or from uh, some of the researchers that we're going to share their ideas that could be innovative and tweaked to match your school setting. Where, what is something that you want to learn more about or do some research on yourself? And also, what do you what thoughts and ideas are you having that are really kind of unique and that you might want to talk to somebody about and get more information? So as we move forward, education this summer, as we all know, uh, between extended school year programs for special needs students and um, the potential to increase our fall opportunities by starting schools early, there are many, many, many creative ideas out there. I know in my own school, we've already held a avoid the summer slide uh, session with some parents, trying to encourage them to continue the reading, which we do every year, but this year it's so much more important because when we come back in whatever form it is in the fall, we're definitely going to have to do educational instructional triage to find out which children have gained, which have lost ground, and where we're going to um, instructionally throw that dart to make the best uh, gains for each individual child. So as we move ahead, um, and in your school system, that's one of the things we wanna ask you, what are you guys working on right now? So our, um, our group came up with a poll, and we'd like to flip over to that. We're actually gonna ask you to answer the poll right now. From our participants, we'd like to know, what are some of the things that you're doing right now to continue the learning in your schools over the summer um, and try to extend what you have for kids? So you can see several of the options there and I'll turn it over to Chris and we'll see how you respond and uh, then we'll talk about the results. Let me just say too, you can check more than one. <laughs> So advice from educators includes 30 minutes of, of reading a day and providing resources to parents is really, really important, uh, including a play-by-play -play to help engage them. And then regular communication, enrichment classes, virtual summer camps are, are already being organized in Michigan. Day camps are going to be uh, open starting June the 8th. So students will actually be able to come back in, at some, some level. Uh, with social distancing. But in other cases, there will be remote uh, learning at a distance kinds of opportunities for kids throughout our state and throughout the country via extension of uh, many of the tools and products that vendors are providing, including Scholastic and Lexia uh, and many others. So I'd encourage you to encourage your staff members and your school districts to provide resources, the free resources to, to parents but follow up with accountability, building some communication to provide accountability. So let's look at the results. 39% of you are planning on offering extended online learning. And about 25%, actually about a quarter of, of you will be offering um, online in-person learning to those with special needs. About another quarter will offer packets of work and suggested online activities, but without regular contact with families. Only about 20% of you are gonna offer food services without extended learning. And about 20% will be closed for the summer. Mm -hmm. And I know that, that for some of you, these must be very difficult decisions. Um, particularly when you look at things like 
food and the role that schools have been playing, or you think about students who really need extra support, and it may just be that your district doesn't have the resources for that this summer. That's the harsh reality we're facing. So as we think about these things, we might wanna think about bridging back to the fall, bridging towards reopening and what that could look like and what we can do as we reopen in whatever way that is, knowing that there are these um, discrepancies between the ideal and what may happen. Next slide. Oh, next, there. So some of the strategies for moving us forward include rotating students between school and at home learning. An example uh, in a local district in suburban Detroit, uh, West Bloomfield is to have school two days a week for students Monday, Tuesday, a day off for cleaning, and then remote for that same group for Thursday, Friday. I've seen a dozen different uh, approaches and ideas coming and I'm currently working with our Michigan Department of Education, uh, focusing on our back to school plan. We likely won't see something from the governor's office until middle to late July, which seems a bit late. But that said, budgets are being cut in this state and across the country by as much as 20 to 25%. Imagine taking 25% of your personal income out of play and how you would have to regroup and remanage your life and lifestyle. School districts across the country are facing that very, very thing. So we need to, in spite of that, find ways that we can provide continuous counseling supports, work closely with health departments, because we're gonna be coming back to doing daily screenings. Will a bus driver take the temperature of a child before he or she gets on the bus? Will we take their temperature before they come into the building? How will we, how will we de determine who has been exposed to COVID-19? There are so many questions to be answered but we're learning so much. The good news is we're learning so much from this calamity that will help us moving forward, both in terms of instruction, learning, curriculum, delivery, uh, and relationships, building relationships with families. I've seen great growth in that space. Chris? Yeah, I would just say too, if you look at this list, there's all these things from the restroom policies and where you drop kids off and how does that go um, to what happens as students is maybe it will be teachers who transition between classrooms rather than students. But if someone's being sent to a school nurse, what does that look like? If there is an infection in your school or community, what happens to your school? So I know you're thinking about all these things and we just urge you to to build into your plan some flexibility so that you have a way to adapt to the circumstances. So beyond that eight, I have a list here of 52 questions and issues that superintendents and principals are trying to address in our consideration of how we come back to school. All of your schools are facing the very same questions. And so please add your innovative idea, as zany as it might sound at this moment in time, it could be a reasonable and viable solution in the near future. So here we go, we're preparing to reopen. And as has been noted, uh, for example, I'm a principal in Pennsylvania. We're pretty close to the New York City, Jersey, Philadelphia region. And uh, we're still on full stay at home order. And um, other areas of the country have already opened up and are um, following distance or social distancing guidelines but that might look different. So here are some things to consider from your lens, because every community has their own uh, resources and um, limitations to this answer. So some of the things to consider is, of course, number one, safety, do no harm. Make sure that every decision you're making is keeping the, the children and the community as safe as possible within the guidelines, whatever they are that you're being provided in the area of our country that you're in. Secondly, people need to be heard. You need to listen and talk to your parents, to your teachers, and if age appropriate, to the students. Find out what they're comfortable with. What are their ideas? For example, 
in our district, we're starting to talk about all different plans. So when our governor or our health department tells us our, our guidelines in Pennsylvania, we're ready to go with a, with a plan. And one of those is that we're gonna be serving our parents to say, are you even comfortable in sending your child back to us in the fall, no matter what the direction is? Or would you prefer to have an option of a, of a public cyber uh, element to keep your children home? Now, we're asking, we're gonna listen to what comes back. And then of course, there's several more survey uh, questions on there about a hybrid setting and about returning to a full brick and mortar school. The other thing is, try not only listen, but try to engage multiple groups so that we're hearing from different people's perspectives and realize that teachers need time to put all of these things together and they need your support as school leaders to do some trial and error because not everything's going to work well the first time. Um, next slide, please. As we move forward too, and I, I noticed in the chat, there was a, there was a, a note about inequities of um, access to internet and that type of thing that is absolutely true. We have to really start to look at how can we bring a level table to this playing field because this is not going to be new. We do have some time to plan for it. So for example, um, one of the things that we taught that the research tells us is UDL or uh, is an approach that definitely helps us equitize under universal design for learning, allows us to be flexible and challenges us to design something that's good for all. So how, what are multiple ways we can engage students? What are ways we can instruct that all children can learn from? And what are, how do we allow kids to show us how they can perform, not just through a traditional method? With everything we're managing right now with distance learning, we're being challenged to do exactly that right now. So that, those are pieces we need to keep in the forefront because whether it's access to internet, um, the quality of the, the digital tools that are available, or even the availability of supports, we need to find ways to give more time and equity and allow teachers the time to connect with these kids. One of the number one things that we know is we've I've talked about is the need for the social emotional connection. Well, that comes with time. Um, our staff, our teachers, our leaders need to be able to have the flexibility to reach out and be especially for some of our most vulnerable students and do what they know is right for those children. So as school leaders, this is a time for us to back up and make sure that we're giving them that, ex that access. The other thing is to get really creative with how are we making sure that our children are building relationships? What are they being charged to do? For example, how are they interacting even under the social distancing guidelines? And how are we allowing them to build that peer support? The good news for most parts of the country is that we're seeing, we're seeing a- Next slide. Assuming a dramatic improvement or a plan for um, connectivity. That is, we're seeing millions of dollars throughout the country spent to provide internet access, Wi-Fi access, and tools to students in sort of remote locations. And so that's, uh, that's a bit of good news for us. But there are other ways to get to our kids uh, and keep them engaged. One of our biggest challenges throughout the country, as I'm hearing from principals from east to west coast, is keeping students and families engaged. The warm weather has started, so many are dropping off. In one district, in a suburban, wealthy suburban district, out of Detroit, uh, they've lost connectivity with 40% of their students. That is, their 40% are MIA, and they still have two weeks of school left. And we've seen challenges in other districts where they've lost as many as 60% of their kids. And in others, they're at 90% connectivity. So kids need to be motivated uh, to stay connected with their class, and that comes by virtue of virtual meetings, class meetings, where they can see and communicate with their peers and their teacher on a regular basis. We're doing that in some parts of our state and it's working. We need to also really consider uh, 
doing things differently by virtue of if we're stuck in a room, provide a virtual travel to explore new places. And that can be done simply by a teacher or leader going into the woods and, and uh, via Zoom, I should say via Facebook, Facebook Live, um, or, or um, YouTube, uh, really connecting with the kids with really exciting science activities, engaging activities, and then include, include students in the process. Let students lead a lesson. Let them share an experiment that they've done. We did that uh, not uh, too long ago with our kindergartner who demonstrated making orange juice uh, from oranges. He was so excited about it and his classmates were delighted to, to see his presentation, highly engaged. And then we need to give them a chance to experience different careers. And that includes high school students that are now currently engaged in welding, virtual welding, learning to weld virtually. It's simply computerized. It's pretty amazing stuff. More of that is coming. And this is just the beginning of, of what we will see in the future. It helps us become more efficient and more effective in instruction in teaching and learning. And the feedback cycle is still apparent and real. Chris? Yeah, I just want to um, point out that we've been receiving some requests to, to get our resources. At the end of the PowerPoint, which you will receive uh, after the session is over, we have links to all the research articles we've cited here. So you will have direct access and links to those. And the other thing I want to say about virtual reality is this is really a challenge to our uh, technology innovators. You know, they've taken it to one level with what we have available right now. But you can imagine with everything that's happening, that there's people right now behind the scenes that are doing more with virtual reality. So I would say, keep your eyes open. There's probably a lot more to come in this area. Chris, we have partnered with an organization uh, in the West Coast and we're beginning to build STEM cities, STEM and STEAM cities, so that even outside of K-12, parents, families can take as many as 45 science courses and get certified and trained and and some college credit uh, and virtually free for them. So free resources, high quality, highly engaging resources coming to cities to build them uh, for our future. If you can give us some information on that, that would be wonderful, Paul. Yes, that may indeed. not be in my links already, but if you can help us gain more information, thank you. Next slide, were... I'm looking at the time. So we're gonna go quickly <coughs> through this next part. So we have enough time to really focus on the visioning process. But Paul, higher order thinking. Think about your background as a scientist, as a science teacher. Well, it's really important, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we help equip families as we're working uh, remotely and learning at a distance, that we send lab kits home, disposable lab kits, uh, and make the list and help parents prepare with tools and, and things that they have uh, at, their, at their home. But make sure that you send a play-by-play -play description of about how a, in a science experiment or activity is to be done. Nothing more frustrating for a parent uh, than missing some parts uh, and or directions to help support their child's learning. And then have students teach the class. As I mentioned earlier, they can pick learning outcomes and develop activities they can share with their entire class. And consider virtual experiments. Uh, Journal of Vi Visualized Experiments is, is a, a great resource. And what we're using uh, is simply going online, Zoom, and just Google science experiments. Some are very, very easy to do, but very compelling and engaging for students from kindergarten to 12th grade. So we're facing also the possibility of starting uh, classrooms with low numbers of students, whether they be in physical spaces or virtual spaces. And so some ideas that are out there on the platform are to consider how can we use the co-teaching model. I saw in the comments that there's a significant amount of concern for children with IEPs and children with learning, di learning disabilities or other kinds of um, ther therapeutic needs. And that is definitely a challenge of our time. So if we can capitalize on the strengths and the lower class size, 
to bring together in a co-teaching model that might look like a virtual teacher partnered with an, a face-to-face -face teacher. It might look like a collaborative learning with some children social distancing over a, a, a digital platform and some children face-to-face. There's also the flipped classroom model, which would be the instruction, the formal instruction, direct instruction comes out on a video component or over a virtual. And the time spent face-to-face -face is in small group remediation, exploration, and in enrichment categories. So one of the pieces, no matter how creative we get with all of these limitations uh, that could be put around us, is to consider professional development needs for staff. Not all teachers are at the same spot with understanding how to use these tools or to deliver instruction effect effectively in these manners. We need the time to teach them. I have teachers using Flipgrid and Nearpod and some really amazing tools. So for example, as, as Paul had mentioned before, um, I, I have teachers that have assigned, we call it a wax museum, where they have to, children have to do research on a historic figure then pretend to be that person and uh, give an oral report. But we did that now virtually on Flipgrid so they can all see each other and it's just really a wonderful experience. But that came about because of the, the idea to put that on a video virtual came about because of our situation. So there's a lot of creative tools out there. So Missy, you mm -hmm. brought up special ed and I know we've had a couple comments online. You know, it is a difficult time and we know that we're not adequately providing services right now. Uh, the Council for Exceptional Children, the National Center for Learning Disabilities, the Federation for Students with Special Needs are just a few of the organizations that really are focused right now on helping us try to find solutions. Here's one idea from a teacher uh, at, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that's to have some of the students who don't have reading uh, difficulties record posts, uh, record reading selections so that students who have trouble reading can understand and hear those. So you combine that with universal design for learning, and then we think about uh, collaborative teaching or co-teaching, and what is the special educator going to do while there's a, a teacher in a classroom with 10 kids? Is the special educator going to be helping the other kids out virtually during that, that time? You know, we need to get creative and there will be solutions that come, but thankfully most people are showing a great deal of patience right now. And um, I think that is needed along with understanding that if we have extended summer schools, we're gonna have less regression that will help some. So just another um, reminder about mindfulness. And this is an example from our, our book on mindful practices and what it says essentially is that courage is one of these things that we need to consider and here's a very simple exercise so we're just giving you one right now and but we have i don't know if it's close to 200 pages almost of these exercises in our books they can be adapted for various grade levels so i i do think for many students right now you know your students, think of your students. Some of them want to be asked about what's going on. They want information and knowledge. They wanna be able to talk about it, to problem solve, to think it through. And courage is one of these positive ways of looking at what's going on. Next slide. Okay, so we are now at the point <laughs> where we're gonna talk a little bit about the process. That's fine, we, we can go ahead two slides. So we've been giving you lots of ideas, the macro and micro elements. Here are some of the things we talk about in the book. And some of this comes from our understanding about um, corporations that have been hugely successful. So go ahead and keep your vision statement in present tense. Accenture, which is a company that works on the digital frontiers, and in, in a disruptive way, says, let's think about the cloud, social and collaboration technologies, and then allow organizations to tap into these 
What can we do to support this? What about an inspirational phrase? Here's one from Apple. Constantly innovating. Focus on the few that are truly important. They focus on the simple rather than the complex. On the face of the earth, they are here on the face of the earth to make great products. Make a vivid picture. Here's something from Amazon. To find and discover anything they want online. And again, you have to think about these corporations and how wildly successful they've been with these elements. The last one is evoking emotions. For that, we'll go to Starbucks. And way back when, and their, their um, vision statement has evolved over the years, as many of these have. But in 2015, they said, to inspire and nurture the human spirit. Now, you wouldn't have necessarily thought that a coffee shop would have that as part of their vision. So sample vision statements. This one is from classrooms in the Netherlands. And it's a, um, it's a system that's been going on for probably the last four or five years. And they have a campus where students are on individualized programs. The teens check in as they want to. They select their own projects. They decide who they're gonna work with. They use their social media as they choose to. And they're getting really good results. Results that are every bit as good as more traditional approaches and perhaps even better in places. So you might wanna research them, check them out. I don't know with social distancing exactly what the classroom space, the environment would look like, but it may be that in the future, we'll envision something radically different than what we have right now. Paul Reville is a, a researcher at Harvard University who's been writing about the future for a long time, the future of education. One of the things he tells us is to never lose the opportunity of a crisis. And he talks about equity, for example, and the need for a major course correction. We've been saying, if you think about a vision for the future, what are some of the elements we believe are critical? Equ equity is one of those things that could make a huge difference for all of us. It will take a major effort, but it could make a major difference. So what are the other things? We believe focusing on alleviating trauma is going to be key and critical. Compassion. And then what can we do knowing what we know about the neurobiology of the brain and how people learn, how children learn? Knowing what we know about executive functioning and neuroplasticity. We know that children don't all learn the same and the pace of learning isn't always the same. So that in fact, we might be able to adapt our approach to curriculum and instruction so there's more student self-determination where possible, more student ownership, more student and maybe even family decisions about areas of focus for certain students. You know, I think we've been dealing for a long time with an industrial model and maybe now provides an opportunity to step away from that model. Paul? So the future of education is changing pretty dramatically, but it's in front of our eyes. Think about, for those of you who are a little bit older, I'm 63, so I remember the first cell phone in a bag. Do you remember the bag phone that sat in the car seat next to you? Many of you are too young, I'm afraid. But think about how we've moved from a flip phone to a 10X, or the latest version of an iPhone or a Droid. That same amount of information in your phone is three or four times that that landed us on the moon. Amazing, amazing changes. So think about how education is going to look differently. We, we talk about it, we listen to futurists, we read about them, but kids' brains are wired differently now uh, and they're motivated by gaming, by games as learning. Even my own grandchildren love to get feedback and move to the next level of any education game they're playing. 
personal learning challenges, personal pursuits, kid interests is very, very important to motivating them to want to learn. And we have to stop shutting them down. Allow them to find two or three ways to get to the right answer. We also have learned so much more about metacognition, the neuroscience behind teaching and learning. And we have to use that science as we teach reading and mathematics. We have to use the way, the information that we've learned over the course of the last 10 to 15 years about how the brain develops and processes language to help us teach reading in a better, more effective way. And then STEM and STEAM, it's moving. It's moving very, very rapidly. And in order for us to protect our democracy as it is, we need to provide equity, equality, and resources for, for everyone. Everyone, not just the wealthy middle class, upper middle class, and the, the wealthiest of our, our, our country, but for everyone so that they can share in our country's wealth so that we can actually move on and share our wealth with the rest of the world. That's our moral imperative. That's our moral responsibility. Chris? Yes, so I just wanna um, echo what Paul said and also say, let's focus a minute for, on metacognition. You know, metacognition means that, that the individual knows something about he, how he or she learns, right? So the individual can, can say, you know what? I learn pretty well when I go online, or I, I do better if I talk to someone about my learning. So there's some self-assessment that goes on. Again, that's putting responsibility on the individual, but there's ways to teach these skills as well. So maybe metacognition becomes something that is part of our curriculum so that we make sure that students have a better understanding of not only their emotions, which we talk about with social emotional learning, but also about how they learn. And then I wanna say with STEM and STEAM, think about maker spaces. You know something about those. And imagine what kids might be able to do in small ways or in larger ways with maker spaces. I think there could be things that could be done with kind of a minimal amount of uh, material, or maybe there are kits that are distributed to kids and they create their own maker spaces. Chris, we're doing that very thing at our major conferences. That is, our innovative, innovative principal leaders are teaching other principals about maker spaces. And I would encourage you to encourage families to have a family meeting where they're speaking about metacognition, about themselves and about their children, thinking about thinking, about their emotions and about their learning. That leads to increasing long-term memory uh, skill and success. So I want to remind you that you will be getting a leader's guide as part of the follow-up to this and that for our third session on June 15th there will be another leader's guide and during that session we're going to go back and kind of cover the middle of the book which includes an example from Missy about how she implemented visioning at her schools. Uh, she's worked with two schools, one for a long time in Pennsylvania and one for a shorter period of time. But she'll talk about her process and how that's evolved and what she's doing now. And we'll also talk about such things as barriers, sustainability, and again, some of the trends we see. We'll continue to look at the trends between now and uh, two weeks from now and when we meet again. Missy, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, I, I think I want to remind everybody on the call, well, no matter your position or the, the place that you are in school, whether it be leadership or instruction, this is a time where visioning is probably the most crucial thing to drive forward during this crisis or during times that are unknown. Um, using the tools that Chris and Paul and I have shared with you, hopefully will allow you to be pull the confidence that you know you have, depending on your community, the pieces that you know are so important to serve your students and allow them to continue on no matter what our platform looks like. It's also a time to be empathetic as a leader and make sure that you're using your own skills to not only take care of yourself, 
but to truly care for those that you're serving. Um, and I want to end just by saying thank you for being champions to our children, because the way we get through this is together. And, the, and by sharing everything that we know, our successes and failures, we're all going to be better for it. So Paul, anything? Well, to reiterate what you both shared, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for leading in your space. Uh, I will also work in the private sector. I own a couple of businesses and I believe more than ever uh, in my life that the roles that you are playing are so, so important, more important than ever. And some of the most important uh, in the entire country as leaders, teachers, uh, principals, superintendents, counselors, and social workers. So God bless your work and thank you for leading. So if you choose to hang around, that's fine. I think we have a couple closing slides. Dana, do you want to just share those slides? And we'll decide whether to go to breakout rooms or just hang out together. Yep. So thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Our funding does come from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which requires us to evaluate our services. Attendees that provided their email address will receive an evaluation survey 24 hours after the close of today's event along with today's slide presentation and archive of the webinar. Um, cer CEU certificates and pres or present participation certificates, um, links will also be included in that email. We really do appreciate your honest and anonymous feedback, which provides information to SAMHSA and assist us in planning future meetings and programs. Um, we also invite you to join our Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative. Um, you will be invited via email to the Base Camp platform where you can access some of our resources. Uh, we have another final session of this webinar series on June 15th and on June 16th there's a webinar about trauma-informed yoga in schools with me. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. Please uh, reach out to us if you have any questions whatsoever and stay on the line if you'd like to chat with us.